the last 10 years and 19 seasons, Survivor is taking you to some of the most stunning locations around the planet and introduce unforgettable personalities. I feel we owe it to the island spirits to let it be in the end the way Mother Nature intended it to be, for the snake to eat the rat. He's burnt. He's burnt pretty bad, Jerry. Look at these things. It was either going to be my buddy or my grandmother coming. My grandmother's not here for a reason. Meet Dragon Slayer. Ah! Victory is mine. I want to give individual immunity to Natalie. I've lost my reign as dumb as a lot of hell. I ain't finished playing just yet. The winner of the first Survivor competition is Rich. And in the process, forever changed the face of television. Hi everyone and welcome once again to GeekFest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone and joining me today we have three of our contributors. We have Tony here in front of me, we have Steve Vavona in front of me, and on location from <laughs> undisclosed parts of the country, <laughs> we have Steve Lux. Say hi gentlemen. Hi Hello. everybody, and if you if you hear any hammering through this show, it's because we are at an actual Amish barn raising. <laughs> Greetings. Not sure if you guys know what that means, but the, the <laughs> subject <laughs> that we're, we're tackling today is reality television. Nice. Now, let me first give you the heads up that some of you might remember that we've done a reality-based show in the past where we examined reality as a whole in terms of how it's portrayed on movies, television, you know, what you would consider to be the history of reality entertainment all the way back to the gladiator days, believe it or not. But today we're going to focus a little more on television and specifically some of the shows that some of us in our group have chosen to watch in this reality world that we seem to live in or now. genre. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a completely new genre if you think of it. Not new anymore. Not new. We're, we're deep in it and, and I'm hoping we're kind of maybe coming out of it in a way. But as you will hear, some of us embrace certain portions of it and some of us embrace absolutely none of it (laughs) (laughs) so let's start a little bit about you know what kind of shows you know do we watch and you know how does that work for us in terms of you know do we accept them or not tony what do you think well i would first point out that i think even within the reality genre i would put like three subsets there's the competition shows like american idol dancing with the stars then there's other types of competition shows like Survivor, which are more individually character-based as opposed to talent. And then there is the Honey Boo Boo subset, which is almost just finding people whose lives train are wrecks. a bit of a train wreck <laughs> and putting them on television to watch. So for I, myself, I, agree I, with that. I uh, kind of follow the first two categories of that, not so much the last category, but mm-hmm. um, I mean... Can any of you remember, just as far as television goes, because like I said before... In different markets, and different mediums, reality has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. But as far as television, what do you guys think? Steve, what do you remember about where did reality television originate? Well, I mean, for me, growing up as a kid, the first memories I have of reality television uh, would be things like The Gong Show, you know, which was essentially a variety (laughs) program. The Carol Burnett you know, variety shows that they used to have, even, you know, things like Candid Camera, which were, you know, shot on film. But those were, in essence, reality television as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, lest we forget that the catalyst for this particular podcast today was a very active conversation held (laughs) over social media between the four people on this uh, podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, really, we started talking about not only shows that we liked, but started ranking them and, you know, discussing their validity as television programming based on, you know, whatever subgenre they might fall into or who the shows were about. So realistically, things have changed so much than the reality genre has splintered off into so many different areas that uh, it's not necessarily accurate to just classify it all as reality television because it means so many different things to so many different people. But, you know, 
in my opinion, there are still uh, worthwhile programs that are on now, you know, that I've been watching for a long time. And some of my cohorts here don't necessarily agree with me, but that's okay. <laughs> well, one of them in particular. <laughs> yeah, the guy who well, shares I mean, the same so I, name. I, I, <laughs> well, I guess at this point I'll bring up, since I think the show and the conflict we're talking about has to do with Survivor. And well, just well, you know, actually, Tony, you kind of what started it was you had mentioned in our little Facebook group. Oh, was dancing, dancing with, with the stars, with Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams, and you had mentioned, well, he's going to be on it. Will Steve Vavona watch it because of Billy D., or will he just you know pass it over because? And I said, no, I wasn't going to watch it. Even but was though, it because it was a reality show? Uh. Yeah, I think that that was probably my rationale as much as I might follow a certain actor, celebrity, whatever. Can I ask I, a question? Sure. What if it was Bruce Campbell? No, I, with the stars? if it was Bruce. I mean, you know, if the Sci-Fi Channel uh, started a show like What All About Bruce, you know, and that was the title, <laughs> I guess maybe I would be compelled to watch it. But it, yeah, it wouldn't well, I, be my first choice. Well, first of all, I would say that a show like Dancing, as much as it's reality, it's also an athletic competition. Yeah, it's a competition. So, I mean, it, it's, I don't agree with you even just kind of ranking it as reality yeah. and therefore. No, I was definitely tarring all these shows with the same brush, which was probably not the right thing to do. And I have to confess that I watched American Idol for a good 10 years before I dropped it. Again, this is maybe another subgenre of reality, but I watched Trading Spaces on HGTV or sure. TLC, yeah. whatever that, that it was. That qualifies. I, I watched it, and I even watched, and you know, this is probably gonna just you know ruin my rep, uh, but I watched Queer Eye for the Straight Guy that for, explains for a lot. maybe like a year, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so I have to admit to watching some of these things that I, but in a sort of a general sense. I'm not all that pleased with the phenomenon. Well, you know, Queer Eye was innovative and, you know, kind of set the tone for these makeover shows that are yeah. extremely popular nowadays. And it basically put Bravo on the map. I mean, who had ever heard of Bravo before Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? It was, you know, essentially right. a, uh, you know, final destination for opera and, you know, ballet and things of that nature. Yeah. It was really more cultured. But if you were to watch it now, it looks nothing like that. Well, not only that, but there are a lot of these networks, cable networks, that normally would be associated with something. All of a sudden, they get a reality mm -hmm. show that almost has nothing to do with what they're associated with. their original with. Well, mandate. Like history they, has ice road truckers. Right, think, and they and become more popular than their original intent. Intent. Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, shows, I mean, there were certain networks that I think, like A&E, I mean, Steve mentioned Bravo, which is a great example, but also uh, A and E, and maybe TLC, AMC. A well, AMC. Well, but the <laughs> AMC's become known for drama, good drama. You know, the, some of these other networks, and I guess it's a survival thing that they've sort of embraced this genre. And if they've had success with it, then they want to have more success. I mean, they've also A and E has a uh, scripted drama, like there's a show called Longmire that I love mm -hmm. that's on A and E. But yeah, most of these networks have gone way beyond their original mandate to embrace all different kinds of, you know, shows, whether they be scripted or reality. But I think that what my original what might have gotten lost in my ranting has been more that the let's just call it a genre and let's just call it reality. We've made the point that there's a lot of subgenres within it. And I think you could probably say this about scripted works, too, is that it's uh, spawned sort of a lowest common denominator, slippery slope situation which the one of the three that Tony mentioned is that that element of train wreck television that more than anything, I guess the word is disgusts me. I mean, I know it's a strong word to use, but that to me seems more like the, when you talk about like Paris Hilton, the Osbournes, the Osbournes, that kind the of Kardashians, the, the train wrecks, the train wrecks, the honey boo boos, the Long Island medium, the, all that stuff. I mean, the people whose lives are train wrecks and they see the opportunity to become famous they have no real talent. They have nothing to hang their hat on except the fact that they're a disaster. And I just, I don't like that. I don't know how else. To, and, you know, I, I would put like Bridezilla in that category. I would put, like I said, Honey Boo Boo, uh, The Real Housewives, all those different shows. And I know some of it is hyped up and amped up and staged. So it's not even 
true reality. reality. Yeah. But that stuff, it just, it really gets under my skin and I, I will never watch it. Well, what's interesting is that, again, if you look at the history of reality, and Steve mentioned it before, like shows that are kind of contestant based, in a way, it's a reality show. It's like a game show. A game shows are mm-hmm. kind of reality shows, unless you're dealing with like a scandal where a game show is fixed, mm-hmm. then it's not a reality show. Right. Or when even a show like Survivor, some people accusing it of being too scripted, edited, edited yeah. and too scripted. It's like when does it? It's no longer a reality show, and in a way, it's also funny how like daytime television used to be littered in game shows, game shows, and yeah. now it's all talk shows, talk shows, reality shows and like judge shows judge yeah. shows, yeah. Right. and it's like it's all re- if you think yeah. about it judge shows are reality shows too yeah it's, yeah. it's a weird and, and, I mean, combination you know I would have to agree with Steve yeah in yeah, his point there you about go. in his point about <laughs> in his point about game show I mean game shows have been around since the 40s right in radio and For the radio, 50s sure. in television yeah so you've yeah. had that competition uh, genre in existence and you could I suppose uh, put uh, Survivor into the same category as American Idol and Dancing with the Stars uh, quite, well but... just just say it's a it's, it's a competition there's mm-hmm. more drama there than the game shows yeah uh, the game shows are very simplistic right but there is that element to it and also and and i know steve has brought this up before too and it's the one show that i i think started this trend more so than survivor was the real world on mtv Mm -hmm. which i also confess to watching how about you steve did you used to watch that one oh yeah i did i watched it when it was first on the first cast was based in new york what was fascinating about it was it really did you know, take on that voyeuristic approach in that we were, you take these people, you put them in this somewhat manufactured living environment, and then we're just going to capture their somewhat (laughs) mundane activity. And at that point, we really didn't know what was contrived and what wasn't. So I'm sure that there have been interviews with producers of that first season of The Real World where they were setting up different scenarios, but it didn't seem like it was set up. It seemed very authentic to me. Yeah. And, you know, once people got a taste for it, they just wanted more. Mm-hmm. And I would liken Big Brother to probably the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the closest, Big Brother, um, you know, the closest offspring of the real world as far as what's on the air nowadays. And I would say I wouldn't even watch Big Brother because it just seems so... Yeah. It just seems like you said before, lowest common denominator. Right. The, the, the trashiest people well, are the it, ones you know, who get the most... It's putting people together and... And either manufacturing conflict or as a producer, you choose people who you get like a, say, a group of 10 people. And in your mind, you're saying, oh, this person's going to hate this person and this person's going to hate that person. And there's going to be real tension Mm -hmm. and throwing them into the arena, so to speak, and just watching them eat each other alive. Two men enter, one man leaves. That's kind of what Survivor is, too. But for some reason, Survivor to me seems a lot less trashy (laughs) than Big Brother. Tony, why don't you tell us about, at least from your perspective, what are some of the more legitimate shows that you would watch? As far as well that I that goes. I do watch, like I said, I, I mean I watch Idol, I watch Dancing, I, I've liked them both since they started. You know, back way back yeah, those when, are I, pretty similar. Those are more like the competition, but the competition, and, and, and what do you call them? Um, pageantry and uh, well, it's talent, talent shows, talent, shows. talent, talent shows. Like, yeah, like a talent. It's like contest. Star Search. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's a modern <laughs> version of that, and but I mean, technically they fall under the reality genre. I and mean, you love spelling bees, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. The National Spell. <laughs> I will be watching the National Spelling Bee when it airs. I used to watch The Apprentice. Um, yeah. yeah, The Apprentice. The Trump mm-hmm. show, which was entertaining for a while. But also, in the beginning, it started like focusing on people getting a job with Trump. But then it morphed into Celebrity Apprentice, where a lot of times it was a lot of these train wreck celebrities well, see, competing that, for, that, that for charity. Up. But I mean, granted, it's for charity. But I mean, I watched it. It was entertaining, but it lost something. Th- that brings up the notion of the celebrity reality shows brings up something that really, again, I don't like. It seems like it's the last stop for these celebrities on their way to complete and total but honestly, obscurity. For some people, it is the last stop before rebooting their careers. Well, yeah, you could say that. But because dancing, dancing with the stars. I mean, really, you, you look at the stars they started off with, and it was, and still nowadays, some of them they're not necessarily a list stars, right. but well, very a lot of them, of them become are. better known after but, they well, appear. But on just the show. like any other television show. 
reality as a whole knows that if you want a boost in your ratings, throw a celebrity. Throw a celebrity. Either make them a contestant or make well, them some I kind was, of guest. I was talking less about like uh, Celebrity Apprentice and more about like Celebrity Rehab oh, and okay. stuff like that. I mean, again, Speaking that kind of goes rebooting. back to- yeah. And, you know, so that l- less, you know, going again more towards the train wreck aspect, you know, of seeing sometimes really beloved actors from our youth just completely melting down. And, and the notion that, you know, I'd sooner see them signing their life away at a convention, you know, making a few bucks at Chiller or something than I would seeing them on, you know, just completely melting down and bearing their pathetic lives, you know, in the hope of either rebooting their career or just making a couple of bucks. And I can't blame anybody for making a living, mm-hmm. I, you know, in however, whatever they're reduced to, I may feel sad for them and I may refuse to watch it. But I do understand that for some of them, that might be their only option. But again, it's just, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I just find it distasteful. Steve, you mentioned some of those home makeover shows. In a way, would you say that This Old House was a reality show? Yeah. Well, I mean, This Old House is probably the first DIY reality show that that was (laughs) out there. Um, Yeah. You know, but even to this day, it still remains somewhat pure, you know, in the way that they, the, the show is essentially unchanged. It has the same formula for be yeah. how, how many years 20 years 20 plus years and it's not as flashy as like extreme makeover home edition was that ushered in things like extreme home makeover which actually started out as just a straight up makeover with plastic surgery and then they would alternate with doing a, a you know redoing somebody's home and then that kind of morphed into this whole charitable contribution type approach where they would you know reward families who were deserving and you know they have some sort of adversity but again that much like most other things. And, you know, this really speaks to the life cycle of these shows and why there are so many new ones that keep hitting the air every single year, every single TV season, is that they do kind of flame out. You know, people get tired of seeing these people unless they really are train wrecks or unless there's something compelling. I mean, you know, you look at Survivor, they've been on, what is it, the 19th cycle or the 20th cycle? I think cycle. Said 24 seasons. You know, they've been going for almost, uh, they've been going for 10 years. So yeah, because they, they do two seasons a year. So it's like 12 years. Exactly. Yeah. To me, what's compelling about Survivor since it started this whole, was somewhat of, of getting me involved in this conversation, was <laughs> that, yes, at its heart, it's a competition, you know, game show, if it's you will. Show. But in reality, no pun intended. Uh, no pun intended. Re- <laughs> it is a social experiment. And what happens is it's outwit, outplay, outlast. You have to be able to withstand the terrible living conditions, starvation, cold, heat, being wet, you know, dealing with bugs, dealing with infections, you know, all kinds of things. You also have to deal with the fact of these physical challenges, which are very difficult to compete in when you don't eat, you don't sleep, you're constantly, you know, feeling sick. Throw on top of that the psychological game and never knowing who you can trust or if you can trust anyone or if you can trust them, maybe for this tribal council, but not necessarily the next tribal council. So in addition to that, I view those testimonial portions of Survivor as an outlet for the contestants because they can't talk to each other the way that they really need to talk to someone. And if that outlet wasn't there, these people would lose their minds because they're essentially out there for, you know, over a month dealing with this, with these conditions that most people would never be able to, you know, to take on. And that's why to me, I don't mind that because people often say, well, You know, reality is supposed to mean unscripted television. And we all know that most of it is scripted or at least outlined. And the producers kind of guide people in certain directions. But the fact of the matter is, you know, these people are trying to share their gameplay with the audience because they have nobody else to bounce it off of that they can really trust. They trust the camera. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that's why I I just think the show is brilliant from a a production quality standpoint and the fact that they've been able to mix up even, you know, the very pat formula that they have enough to get new people involved. I mean, our kids love to watch Survivor. My seven-year-old son, you know, was jumping up and down, you know, during the finale of the Kagiyan cycle because he was so invested in the people on the show. His kid's seven <laughs> years old and he's jumping up and down and, you know, his person won the show. So to well, me- Well, Steve, let me ask you a question. Yeah. On a show like Survivor, don't you think there's a flaw, an inherent flaw in the way that the winner is decided? Because 
a lot of times, or every single time, basically, the winner is not decided randomly. It's decided by people that are usually very angry at one of the two people or three people who are, you know, the finalist. And there is no rule about how to vote at the end. It all seems to fall into one or two camps. Either I vote for the person I hate the least, so it almost turns into like a presidential election where right. you're voting for the lesser of two evils, or you're voting for somebody who you think, if you are capable of stepping away from the game, which a lot of these people don't seem to be able to because they're so in the moment of hating these people for the fact that they voted them out. You know, having these people realize that, wait a minute, the fact that you made it this far means that you are a good player. Mm -hmm. In other words, I find it that a lot of times it's almost like you're flipping a coin between which way are they going to go? Are they going to vote with their brain in terms of saying this is what this game's about? Or are they going to vote with their heart of how they emotionally feel that second? How emotionally scarred are they? Well, I think based on this past finale with Tony winning, they voted with their brain, their brain and yeah. certainly not with their heart. Because frankly, by the end of Tribal Council, I thought they were going I was the rooting. Way. I was going to vote for Wu yeah. <laughs> over Tony. And I said, uh, just the other day, I read uh, this article on commenting on Tony winning, calling Survivor the most morally repugnant show because it was basically it awarded somebody with a million dollars for lying and cheating, which I mean, I have to say Tony did bother me. Not so much that he backstabbed people on the island, but the fact that he was swearing on his wife and son and yeah. his dead father. That to me, it's like... I'll let you kind of get away with the other stuff as part of the game, but you don't need to start swearing on your wife and husband. And it's almost like for that reason, even though he played the game well, I probably would have voted for the other guy. Well, it's the Russell thing. factor. It's the Russell but factor. But they didn't, nobody voted for Russell. That was the thing. Russell, for some reason, Tony bothered me more than Russell because Russell seemed to almost embrace his evil. However, at the end of this tribal council, it was the last contestant, Spencer. Who, who yeah. turned around and almost reminded everybody. It's like, guys, you're not here to make friends. Yeah. The best player is the one that manipulates everybody the most. So in other words, in a way, it's giving you a really ugly, ugly, realistic life lesson that, mm -hmm. you know, the best man never necessarily win. The best man yeah. sometimes wins in the game of life or right. whatever the hell right. you're playing. But guess what? If you backstab people and cheat and lie, and you succeed. That also gets you where you want to go, believe yeah. it or not. Generally, the best men are voted out earlier because they're seen as threats. So, <laughs> yeah. right. Steve? Well, you covered quite a bit of ground there. But the, <laughs> the original question was is the ending flawed? And I would say the answer is yes and no. It is not flawed, and again, this is in my opinion, because of the uncertainty that happens in everyday life. And again, I view Survivor as the ultimate broadcasted social experiment. So it's essentially a reflection of what happens every single day in our lives. And the reason it's entertaining is because the audience continually plays these scenarios over and over and over again. I mean, if you just look at the people who have been on the last 10 cycles, how many super fans have actually been on the show and either do extremely well or they do horribly? I mean, look at uh, uh, John Cochran. He was on, he was, again, he wrote his thesis on Survivor <laughs> on this very topic. That's right. And he was not able to sustain or to separate his fandom from keeping his head in the game. Fortunately, he had the opportunity to come back to apply what he already knew about the game, but ultimately what he knew after having gone through the experience. Because again, watching the show and living through it are two totally separate scenarios. But it also takes into consideration the fact that you have so many variables in everyday life. I could walk across the street and get hit by a bus. I could never see that happening. But because I could never see that happening, I should not waste any second of my life because of that reality. And to me, that's the ultimate validation of the show oh, is wow. that, yeah, you can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, and you could win. You could be a stand-up guy and not vote anybody out or not backstab and be honorable, and you could win. That's the point. That's life, man. You have people out there who cheat and get millions of dollars. You know, the Wolf of Wall Street, he finally got caught. Now he's coming back. He has a resurgence in his life. He's a public speaker, and he's making millions of dollars telling everybody how he ripped other people off. 
But you also have people out there who have tried to do good. Look at Bill Gates and the amount of money that he's donated to help people who are less fortunate and has been able to work with his wife and get other people to commit to spending their own money and willing half of their giant fortunes to people who need it. So to me, it's the ultimate reflection in true reality, which is the reality that we live in. Well, let me just ask one question of Steve and see if we can find some common ground here. What's your take on some of the other shows that we mentioned in terms of like the Kardashians or the Gotties or, you know, uh, the Long Island medium or the Amish breaking Amish or things like that? I mean, where do you fall on that? Well, I mean, I don't like most of those shows. I did watch a handful of them just when they were new, for instance. Oh, so Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I watched a few episodes of the first season just because I didn't know what it was about, and I heard Bruce Jenner was going to be on it. Right. But, I mean, that's just absolute trash. And the fact that these people have become, quote-unquote, famous for essentially doing nothing, you know, just it kind of irks me, so I, I really don't care to watch it. I don't watch Duck Dynasty. I don't watch Dance Moms because, again, anything with people dealing with children and treating them, you know, poorly, I just I can't stand that. And, you know, just talking about Dancing with the Stars, one of those Dance Mom moms or coaches or whatever the heck she is was a guest judge on Dancing with the Stars this season. I saw that, yeah. And, man, she is. if that's how she is, then she is a – her behavior is just reprehensible as far as I'm concerned. Who the hell is she to think that she can speak that way to anybody, anybody, based on whether she is or isn't a celebrity? I don't care how successful somebody is, but this woman is a real piece of trash, and no amount of exposure on a reality show or money is going to buy class for that bimbo. Yeah. So I don't watch those shows because, you know, they're white noise to me. You know, I don't really get anything out of them. I prefer right. shows like, or even Dancing with the Stars. I will, You know, my wife watches that. My kids love it. Some of the stuff is a little suggestive, I think, for children, but they do a pretty good job of keeping it, you know, okay for general audiences. But the fact of the matter is, these people, and I'm talking about the non-dancers, I'm not talking about somebody who's an ice dancer and who comes on the show and then winds up winning the program, and I think that's absolutely ridiculous. But the people who have no dance experience, what they have to go through to learn how to dance and to watch them improve and progress over a number of weeks, to me... That's impressive. There's some credibility there because that's interesting. And people probably think, what would it be like if I tried to learn how to dance? Would I be able to do it like they do? Granted, Mm -hmm. you're not working with a professional dancer and having these rehearsals every single day of the week. But to me, I find value in that show for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, Tony, Tony, let me ask you something. How do you feel about any accusation of tampering in terms of when the producers of a show kind of try to sweeten the show a little bit in terms of, you know, if you have a, a reality show like like um, the Comic Book Man, where all of a sudden people show up to the store oh, like and Wolf they're trying to no comes right, and they're in. trying to sell yeah. like that is that's staged. I mean, you cannot assume there's a camera twenty four hours a day right. sitting there waiting for a famous person to show up. Mm-hmm. That is obviously staged. In Survivor, for example, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, certain conversations or certain mm-hmm. things were kind of arrange in a certain way you know do you think that helps or i think at this point maybe in the early days of reality tv people allowed themselves to be manipulated by producers and i'm sure to a certain extent they still do the jerry springer fact but nowadays (laughs) i think people are so media self-aware that they kind of almost manipulate themselves That, that that they will make the choice and to I, I be will just exploited? Go, I will just go back to, to Survivor, and I have no proof of this, but uh, last time Brandon Hance, Russell's nephew, was on. The first time he was on, he was yeah. like this kind of troubled young guy trying to get his life right. He, you know, and then he, he was, was, he he was a, a little, a little, yeah, a little offbeat, but still. But the second time, he's like, he totally flipped his lid. And he wound up leaving. I forgot. I don't even remember if he was voted out the last time or if he just Did left. He, didn't he walk out? I thought he, he might have just walked out. He wanted but to beat somebody up. He went crazy. And to me, the, the, him going crazy, to me, it seemed staged. It was almost like he wanted to be the villain. He wanted he to be a character. To get this, exactly. He wanted to be a character. So when that happened, I can't say that I fully bought it, that it was natural. I figured either maybe he was encouraged to play something up by a producer or maybe he did it himself to make himself stand out more and does that bother me i mean not necessarily if it was his choice it was his choice to kind of 
be that way and do what he did on TV. I don't think the producers are putting a gun to anybody's head and saying, you have to act this way. I think a lot of times it's a personal choice on their part. So is it manipulative television? Probably yes, but... Is it all of television? Frankly, we we let ourselves be manipulated by other shows all the time anyway, so... Can I make a point that's kind of off the beaten track here? And it's just something I wanted to get into the show just so I would have something productive to say. And and I can almost already hear the counter-argument as I'm thinking it. But one of the things that, I guess, saddens me about the, the proliferation of reality television is... I know it's a business decision, much, I'm sure, much cheaper to produce these shows and to generate tons of revenue and and more profit from them than from scripted Mm -hmm. dramas or comedies or what have you. But I feel, I, I kind of feel bad for writers who are being put out of work by the proliferation of these shows and actors. And I would much rather see, just from a personal perspective, I would rather see scripted shows and i know like i said as i'm saying this i know that there is definitely sort of that lowest common denominator form of scripted entertainment the lowest of the low rent sitcoms which i am guilty of watching the soapy dr- i watched dallas the following I, the, the following i mean i watched the rebooted dallas you know i mean I, i've watched soapy dramas and and i've watched the lowest low rent two and a half men sitcoms but Tim Allen. I mean, hey, that's a great show. That know, makes me laugh. The three camera sitcom is is, is pretty. You know, it's kind of had nothing. Its yeah, but you know what? Let, 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 let's all no, calm down. Wait, here. I, let's not call sitcoms the lowest I'm common not, denominator. I'm saying there are now. Just, you're, now you're ticking me dude, off. <laughs> you're not letting me finish. I'm saying you have used the reality analogy. You have something like Survivor, which you guys hold to a higher standard but it also there's the low rent crap you have with sitcoms you have something like everybody loves raymond which we would agree is gold standard material Fantastic. but then you'll have something like uh two and a half men all right all right that you know, example that's i'll the agree point with you i'm on. trying to make so i know i'm sort of making i'm playing both sides of my own fence here but i'm saying there also has been in the last 10 years a renaissance in scripted television, the yes. proliferation of cable shows, some really terrific television has come into being. Mm-hmm. And I just, from a, and I know, you know, really what it boils down to, and I said this in our social media, is it's a matter of taste. And that's just where I'd rather spend my valuable viewing time is with this stuff. Like when shows go into reruns in the summer, and that's when the reality really proliferates. Mm-hmm. And my wife really has no choice because I'm not going to watch these shows. And I think she would if she was given the free reign. But I would sooner catch up on shows that we didn't have time to watch during the season or on DVD or, or whatever. Or even, and I know this, I'm not trying to sound snobby here, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of great British shows that are on like BBC America and, and shows that people don't might necessarily know about that I love watching and, and they're really excellent dramas and comedies and things like that. And that's, like I said, that's just where I'd rather spend my time. Well, Maybe, let, me, I mean, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you something. If people would be willing to watch and spend the time watching color bars for four hours a night, network shows would give you color bars. Mm-hmm. If they made money, it's if yeah. if, if they watch it, the, the content does not matter one bit whatsoever to them. So based on that, to them, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure everybody understands that that the content is not the issue. Is who watches it and how much money does it generate? So no matter what the show is, it doesn't matter. With that said, how far can reality go in terms of you know? I mentioned earlier there was a show that I'm not sure if it ever aired or they were thinking of airing it about a group of people where who work at one company and at the end of a certain amount of period of time, one person would lose their job Mm -hmm. and for real. Yeah. So it's like something happened where, like I said before, either it didn't air, they pulled a plug or something happened where they realized it was maybe a little little too too nuts. So where do we draw the line in that? In other well, words, can we get to Running Man territory at well, some point? Running Man or the Hunger Games? Hunger Games, uh, you, know, so, yeah. you know, prison executions. Uh, you, you, uh, we, the governor pardons the winner at the last minute. Yeah, oh, you know, can, can, who gets can, pardoned? You I know get, that ratings would be there if they had. And again, going back to the the ancient times, <laughs> yeah, gladiator fights. Would you know? Would people watch? I, yeah, they would. I could see a network executive approving that the execution idea. Yeah, I me could too. see that coming down the pipe on Fox. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> it's Thunderdome, and you go in there, and last man out yeah. gets a pardon from the governor. Well, look, people like to see people beating the snot out of each other in MMA and boxing. <laughs> I mean, that's a sport, but it's entertainment as well. Well, is there or a, wrestling? Is there a, a an obligation or a responsibility oh, I don't factor? Know about that like who draws Ask the Tony. line? Who draws the line, Tony? Government or or people or where, where do you draw the line on reality? Please. Well, I don't know. It was like as you're discussing this, I'm thinking, you know, in the Christian community, there was the big thing about Harry Potter that it was drawing people and <laughs> kids into witchcraft and this and that. And that's BS. It's kind of like you know, I don't think the story itself is doing that. It's almost like what other people did after it was created mm-hmm. is kind of it's their responsibility. Yeah, don't blame it's not don't blame Harry Potter for it's just telling a story like, you know, C. S. Lewis or Tolkien did, a fantasy story. So I mean you know, did the creator of Survivor, which seems to be credited a lot as the granddaddy of reality television, despite the real world and all the other examples, Survivor seemed to be, maybe because it was a network show, I feel like Survivor is what people refer to as the start of reality show, because that's when everything really started going in that direction. Yeah, yeah about 12 years um, ago. So, you know, I don't know that you can blame Survivor for Honey Boo Boo. I think at some point, people need to take responsibility for their own decisions, but it does seem like once we get you get like this good interesting thing here and then somebody tries to copy it and in copying it they corrupt it a little more and it happens with everything and you know it kind of appeals to our own little internal corruptions and then society just kind of goes well you know who we have to blame for this right (laughs) who the Brits who make those shows that Steve was talking about before because most of these are rip-offs for British television survivor (laughs) you know all those the the X oh the Japanese do it too yeah yeah, Jap- Japan also. Remember those crazy game shows the Japanese have? Yeah. Yeah. So let's blame them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Steve, let me ask you one question here, and hopefully we can wrap it all up in this. And it's like, yeah. how much life do you think Survivor has left in it? You 12 know, years it, is a huge amount of time. It's still getting ratings. Again, they, they're not what they once were, you know, uh, in the early days or really when it started to take off. But. Look, who knows? The fact of the matter is the criteria that the broadcasters and these networks use to determine what is going to stay and what is going to go are changing every single day. I mean, you have a show like CBS is The Good Wife. I think they drew like 12 million people a week. It was on the verge of cancellation. 12 million people. So, you know, just putting things back into context... If it gets below a certain threshold, and again, these are large conglomerates and they have their P&Ls and their, you know, their forecast that they're trying to fulfill. If it dips below a certain number, they'll kill it and they'll put something else on. But I personally don't feel that it, that it has to end until it starts recycling itself too much. But the fact of the matter is, if you have younger generations that are getting into it and it, they're more vocal now on social media, you know, to really stand up for some of these programs, then... It could go on for a while, but I mean, reality television ain't going anywhere. It's so damn cheap to produce that, uh, again, television is a business first and foremost. So yeah. they're not going to, you know, get rid of these cash cows that have so little, you know, production costs associated with them because they can just keep cranking them out. I mean, you could do three or four or five different shows at the same time for the price of maybe one or two, uh, you know, hour long uh, scripted dramas. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. Tony, speaking of, of what actually drives the show... What's better, bringing in a fresh cast every time or recycling, like Steve said, trying to recycle some of their greatest hits, th- villains and versus heroes and that kind of crap? I think both. It was like, I don't know if it was this podcast or the previous one we are talking about, no, I think you were saying about bringing celebrities in. Well, these reality show contestants are, in a way, celebrities well, when are we going to do themselves. Celebrity Survivor? When no, is no, no, that, no, that going like, to happen? No, I mean, the people who've played already... Are celebrities? I know, but I'm saying like getting. Well, but they've actors had and act- they've had guests, uh, contestants well, that were ex actors. The girl from Facts of Life, a complete. Oh has yeah, been, that's but right. Yeah. Hey, people. I interviewed her. Don't you <laughs> insult Lisa Welchel? <laughs> Lisa Welchel, you Welchel. bastard, you. But, but no, so, but, but like they had people. But they had a, an ABC show called "I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here," yeah. which was kind of like that. So I don't think you need celebrities i think the ordinary people in this kind of challenging situation is quite enough it's really more about the personalities you put together how they react to the environment how they react to each other how they deal with you know needing to get votes from the people that they're voting against it's uh i mean i, th- I think it has life in it what was the question you asked me i don't no, know it was it was which way does the show go do, do they go with unknowns oh, or with celebrities. celebrities their own celebrities like you said the other thing to keep in mind is like for example this past season that i watched 
I really didn't feel invested in any specific character. I couldn't really relate to anybody. Mm-hmm. They were kind of uh or unlikable. They were uh or unlikable. I mean, I liked Spencer. I was kind of rooting for Spencer. Hello, but I, I think when you bring back characters, you've already got some of that investment from the viewers. So I think it's a good idea to, you know, they can't overdo it. I know they're going to do Blood versus Water too. So I'm assuming that's going to be, they're going to be bringing family back members. former players with yeah. family members. But, I mean, I think it's not a bad idea. It worked for them once. They can go to the well one more time. We like to see what's going on in these other people's lives. So I, I would keep doing both because, I mean, this season was, or these two seasons, what do you call it? You know, one had the former players and one had completely new players. Yeah, so, yeah. And I think ratings-wise, I think they both did pretty well. So, Do you guys think uh, we'll ever see their biggest bad guy ever, Russell? You know, I mean, would they want to bring him back to play with Brandon or something? I, I don't, I don't know. I think Russell, Russell struck me as the type who just needs to get over Survivor for his <laughs> own, for his personal mental health. But How about you, who Steve? knows? I would never say never as far as Russell is concerned, but he, uh, he's been pretty vocal about not wanting to do anything else with Survivor. I mean, you know, he's a volatile personality. I connected to him on, I don't know, Facebook or something like that. And, you know, it's some pretty nasty stuff that he talks about. But he was great to watch. I mean, he, you know, people... He was a are, great character. He, he was a great character. And people, you know, are, are ripping on Tony for playing the game the way he did. But Russell was the first guy to find hidden immunity idols without any clues. Yeah. Just because mm-hmm. he was so intuitive. You know, he knew how the game was played, except for one little detail. He got a little... <laughs> too impressed with his own game and he really started you know berating some people and crowing at a pivotal moment in the season i mean he essentially self-destructed because he was so confident he was going to win and he turned the jury off enough they basically gave it to somebody who he just carried along as one of his votes i mean that really is the only reason why she won Uh, and that was just infuriating to him. Steve, what did you think of Tony's swearing on his his wife and kids and dead father and all that? Can you separate that and say, oh, that's just the game? See, I say that's just the game, you know, and again, one could say, well, he stabbed somebody in the head. Is that okay because it's within the game? You know, it's about trying to manipulate people. That's the outwit portion. Yeah, there's no maim part in the (laughs) title. (laughs) Outwit, maim, and destroy. Right, right. I guess you kind of hope that a person doesn't morally compromise themselves so much that they go to bring in their family into the picture. Well, remember Johnny Fairplay? My grandmother's dead. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, again, talk about some forethought, told his buddy, if you come on the the family trip and I'm going to make believe like my grandma is dead, you got to go along with me. You know what I mean? But Johnny Fairplay is also generally thought of as a jackass. He is a jackass, yeah. But again, what is the criteria for who's supposed to win Survivor? Again, look at all the people who won, going all the way back, uh, not even back to, to Richard Hatch, but, you know, looking at, who was the fireman? The guy from uh, from New York. Oh, Tom from Malloy High School, yeah. Yeah, from Malloy High School. I mean, he was a Boy Scout, yet he won. And there were certain things that, you know, that he did to compromise, but, you know, he didn't swear on anybody. And again, it, it all depends on the group of people that you're with. You know, you can't anticipate what it's going to take to convince people. You know, if you look at, and I've been a, I'm a critic of Rob Mariano for a variety of reasons, primarily because he's such a Boston Red Sox fan. Um, <laughs> but you have to admit that he, I mean, he played the game enough. If you played a game three times, damn, you better win on that third time. But the fact of the matter is, the way he was able to control the entire game from the beginning was absolutely brilliant. But does that work the next time somebody plays it? No, because it's a whole different set of people. You don't know if they're going to be persuaded to go along with you, if they're going to be afraid of you, if they're going to want to take you out and be, you know, crafty enough to blindside you. So, you know, I think it's that uncertainty that keeps people in combined with the certainty of, well, we're going to tribal council, the tribe has spoken, you know, people are adamant about them not changing you know, some of those, some of the construct of the program itself, you know, some of those Mm -hmm. mandatory items. But they did change some rules. I remember they used to feed them a lot less and they realized that their, their entertainers are falling down, (laughs) you know, fainting from (laughs) hunger and that doesn't really generate ratings. So they, they were willing to at least change some stuff. Right. Uh, Right. The last point that I wanted to make, again, I can't speak to a lot of the things you guys are talking about, but as we're wrapping this up, I do want to circle back to something that I mentioned in our Facebook group. And at the end of the day, 
Number one, I want to make it very clear that I don't think any less of anybody for anything that they enjoy. Backpedaling? Uh, no, I'm not backpedaling. I really, I do feel it. It's not because I know Steve could kick the shit out of me and I, you yeah. know, I'm afraid of him. <laughs> Damage control. Uh, it has nothing to do with it. But it's also politician. That there is that element of taste. There's that element of even within the realm of scripted entertainment that we're all, let's just say the six of us, we all are children of pop culture and we all love certain things. But within our group, we have subgroups. There are times that we get together in these subgroups because we're talking about something that only the three of us or the two of us really like. But we were just talking in a previous podcast about shows that our very good friend and colleague Tony would never be caught dead watching and is, is really not happy with and uh, you guys talk about sports and i do this <laughs> you know so so there's even within the realm of scripted entertainment we're all over the map and that's just a point i wanted to make that we've you know within our group you know there are certain things that well i know i can only talk to steve about or i know i can only talk to brian about or tony or carl or whoever and vice versa you guys can't talk to me about reality and i just opt out but th that was it. That's the only thing I wanted to mention. Cool, cool. Well, I propose a new show, a new reality show, Steve versus Steve. Oh! <laughs> I'm moving to another state, to an undisclosed <laughs> location. I agree with Steve. <laughs> I, will, I would like to thank all of our co contestants, <laughs> <laughs> participants, I mean guests on today's reality, specifically Survivor-related reality show that we did today. That would be Tony, Steve, and Steve from the Undisclosed Location. And until next time, we will see you guys here at Geek Fest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Keep it real. <laughs> yeah. Good tag. All right. Nice. I'm back. This is the true story. True story. Of seven strangers <laughs> picked to live in a loft and have their lives taped to find out what happens. <laughs> what? When people stop being polite. Could you get the phone? And start getting real. The real world. I agree with Steve. Stop! That's not funny.